Welcome back to part two of lecture six for Inside 306. We're going to get back into this, looking at some context for the Wakefield article we'll be discussing in on Zoom, as well as doing a close reading of the abstract to give you a hint of how to approach an article like this. Switch over to our notes. All right, so this is sort of a complicated timeline. Um, I mentioned in the last lecture that this article got 3,500 citations, most of them very negative. Um, and we will we'll get into some of the details of that uh, in our discussion as well. But basically, this was the, the first article, um, one of the first, I should say, to suggest a potential causal relationship between getting the MMR vaccine, which is standard in um, certainly the US and the, the UK, and the development of autism spectrum disorders. Um, we now know that the there is no such actual causal link, but it sort of made its way into public discussions about vaccinations and about autism and it, it brought up a, a lot of really thorny and complicated and for many people deeply personal issues. Um, so even though this particular essay is not really circulated much anymore in terms of uh, serious scholarship, I still think it's a useful case study, not just in terms of the controversy it uh, enacted, but in terms of what it actually says versus the kind of the made for TV version that gets um, into all of the social media memes. Uh, what impressed me actually about this article is although you know we know that the science was mistaken, and although we know now that there were some issues with the way the study was run that I'll get into a little bit later, it's actually structured about like we'd expect a medical research article to be. Um, there's a reason the Lancet accepted it, a very prestigious journal. So let me walk you through what um, happened here. It started a few years before this one was published. The one we are reading is from 1998. In 1995, um, a separate research group of which uh, Wakefield, who's the lead author on this, was a member, argued that the individuals who had gotten the MMR vaccine were more likely to have certain bowel diseases than those who had not received MMR. Um, now Wakefield's training is primarily in gastroenterology, he's an internist. And so this is sort of where his interest in the potential contributions of the vaccine started. And it also kind of gave him a, a, a launching pad to say, well, if these two variables appear together, then what else might this vaccine be doing? And what happens, as what we'll see in the, the 1998 article, is what happens if we add this third variable of uh, development of autism? And so that is the main thing that we're doing for today. Um, their hypothesis, as we'll discuss, is that persistent infection uh, with vaccine virus, the vaccine virus caused disruption of the intestinal tissue that in turn led to bowel disease and neuropsychiatric disease, specifically autism. So it's an A to B to C link here. And this is, at the point of the article, a hypothesis. One of the things we'll look at is, is in their conclusion, they say, we think this is, this pattern is gonna hold up, but we need more information. We need to figure out how this is actually going to work. And that is a very, I think, reasonable position for scientists to hold. Unfortunately, there are some complications here. So it's useful here to distinguish between the research group of which Wakefield was the, the first author, kind of the lead researcher, and then Wakefield himself. Because as it turns out, a lot of the problems and a lot of the controversy arose from him personally and not necessarily from the 
article itself. Because when this showed up, there wasn't a whole lot. I mean, there was discussion. It showed up in The Lancet. But there wasn't a whole lot of political controversy. And it would have stayed that way if not for one thing. Andrew Wakefield um, gave a video interview and was put on TV at the same time the article came out. And this is where he went a lot further than the actual research article. He said there is definitely a causal relationship between MMR and autism. That is, MMR causes the development of autism in young children. And then everything, shall we say, hit the proverbial fan. Because regardless of what his co-authors actually argued, or even if they agreed with him, now he was on record saying that we have proven this causal link when they didn't have that data. So at this point, he argued that the combination vaccine uh, be suspended. Uh, they, they do you know, for several, several shots at once in that uh, series of vaccinations in favor of single antigen vaccinations. Um, it also came out later that he actually had financial interest in a company that produced single antigen vaccinations, including, I believe, a patent pending on that process. So not exactly an, uh, an unbiased observer here. There were significant social impacts by the time when this hit the popular press, um, as you guys know. The popular version of any given data, any given finding, is going to be a lot more sensationalist and a lot less precise than the actual scientific finding. And so particularly in the late 90s and early 2000s, thousands upon thousands, I haven't been able to find a specific number of parents refused or delayed vaccinations for their children. There have been a lot of effects from that. You can dive into the research if you're interested on uh, incidents of, for example, measles cases, uh, which was basically extinct in the West before this paper came out. And this has sort of been a, a watershed moment in terms of arguments about whether vaccinations are a net gain or a net loss. Um, the whole idea of being an anti-vaxxer kind of was, was born at this stage, uh, although arguably it didn't really get started until there was Facebook a few years later. In 2002, the research group published another paper um, specifically positing a relationship between the measles vaccine and autism. And I mentioned this because remember in the 1998 video, Wakefield had said, the problem is not vaccinations in general. The problem is that when we put measles, mumps, and rubella vaccinations together, they have these negative effects. So let's do them separately. Well, now he's pushing that further and he's saying, you know what? The measles vaccine causes autism. So the single antigen approach is not going to work. And this further vilifies, honestly, the, the entire practice of childhood vaccination, and it kind of stokes the, the, the fires even more, um, especially as more and more parents are refusing these. In the meantime, uh, between 98 and 2010, there were lots and lots and lots and lots of follow-up studies because this was a big deal. And so some of those 3,500 citations are studies trying to replicate the results, looking at this potential link first between MMR and the bowel disease that Wakefield and colleagues had posited in 1995. And of course, also at the main link between MMR and autism in uh, 1998. And they found no evidence of that. Um, repeatedly, they did all these different follow-up studies that the different populations, they talked about every potential variable and they found nothing to support Wakefield's claim. So understandably, by this point, a lot of his co-authors of the original paper are getting very, very nervous because their work is being kind of made into a laughing stock in the medical research community. And so they start sort of distancing themselves from him. Several of them at this point had come out and actually said, you know what, this is not what we agreed to, or there's stuff in the article that we didn't sign off on, all this stuff. 
And um, there's also been a lot more investigations into Wakefield's specific role. So at this point, it came out, for example, um, that there were financial interests that Wakefield did not disclose. Um, you might see some disclosure of conflict of interest um, or financial support or something in some scientific articles at the very end of the article. And it turns out that Wakefield was being paid partly by a group of lawyers that was suing vaccination companies. So they would certainly have um, interest, a vested interest in certain research outcomes. Um, there was a, a lot of pushback on this one paper. So by 2004, um, most of the co-authors had uh, retracted what they called Wakefield's interpretation of that data. And the Lancet starts their investigations then. Um, they exonerated Wakefield and his colleagues specifically from charges of ethical violations and scientific misconduct. So there were some iffy parts there, but even as the Lancet editor was like, yeah, we, we probably shouldn't have published it, they couldn't find anything specific to, to pin on them. Uh, but six years of research later, uh, they found more stuff, a lot more stuff. Um, this is in 2010 when the Lancet formally retracted the entire paper. So if you pull up the link um, on Blackboard, it will have this big retracted stamp of the, both the HTML and the PDF, just in case you want to read it and forget that it's been retracted. This almost never happens in a journal that big, and to that, especially that much later. Occasionally, there will be a, a paper published and a journal will discover maybe like six months down the road or something that there was something seriously wrong with the study or the data was falsified or whatever, it happens. And then they'll retract that immediately. But this is you know, 12 years after the study actually came out. So this is a, a big moment um, for academic publishing as well. Um, at the, yeah, at the same time, I mentioned this, uh, Wakefield actually had his medical license taken away in Great Britain um, because of some of the unethical practices that had come out about how he conducted the study. And one leading voice in that was Brian Deere. Um, he published a series of articles investigating what Wakefield had done, interviewing parents, what evidence he had given, looking to one of his articles, and I believe we also have one of them in here. Um, so I get the page for you, yeah. This is page 201 in our textbook. It's called How the Case Against the MMR Vaccine Against the MMR Vaccine Was Fixed. So it's an interesting read if you want to know more about that case. So ostensibly by this point, um, Wakefield is persona non grata in the medical community. Most serious researchers, if they mention him at all, only do so to criticize his Procedures are kind of cite this as an egregious example of a breach of medical ethics. Um, we can read Deere's article for more details on that. Wakefield, however, has done pretty well for himself because he's become a celebrity um, in the way that only social media can do. In fact, in 2016, he directed a film called Vexed, which is an anti-vaxxer documentary. Um, documentary only in the sense that like Michael Moore's documentaries. He definitely has a political agenda to pursue there. And this has kind of been his second career. So after he got his medical license taken away, um, he's become sort of a folk hero for anti-vaxxers and various groups associated with them. Um, it's an interesting, weird, weird history, but it's one of the relatively few examples where a formal scientific paper um, made a huge social difference, even outside of the, the scholarly world that it was, it was published in. So that's one reason why I picked this one to discuss. I think it is an interesting model of uh, scholarship in itself, but it's also kind of gives us a chance to look behind the scenes and see what actually caused all of the memes and all of the uh, discussion about vaccination. So we'll be looking at that more in our chat session. To help you prepare for that, um, I want to go through the abstract of that article and just kind of walk you through the different moves that it makes to give you a better sense both of what the article is about and to model some of the behaviors that might be helpful as you parse this, because uh, it will take you a while to, to read through this. So we start off with the 
background section. And this is straightforward, one sentence. We investigated a consecutive series of children with chronic consenter, and, sorry, enterocolitis and regressive developmental disorder. So we've got our participants, children, and consecutive series, particularly they're, they're looking at patterns in um, these symptoms. So as I mentioned earlier, they're looking at how all three of these things potentially go together. Um, the MMR vaccine, which is not actually shown up yet in the abstract, this chronic enterocolitis, um, which is a stomach disorder, and calls regressive developmental disorder, which we would label short, uh, shorthand autism. And he, he does get into a little more uh, specificity later on as well. The methods, okay, bear with me, this is a long one. <laughs> so we learned several things here. First, we learn that this is a very small sample size, 12 children ranging from ages three to 10, 11 of whom were boys. So this is where they start. And this is one of the things that Brian Deere looked at a lot in his investigative uh, pieces on this, was how did Wakefield actually find these families? And did the data that the families gave match up with the actual uh, published results? But We'll look at that a little bit uh, later in our discussion. These particular children were referred to a uh, hospital, specifically to pediatric gastroenterology, gastro that's a hard word, gastroenterology. Um, and this in itself, of course, is not particularly unusual. They were having some stomach issues. But what was interesting um, for Wakefield about this group was they started off with normal mental and physical and social development, followed by a lot of those skills, including language skills. This is a, a common symptom, particularly of autism. Along with these gastroenterological symptoms, diarrhea and abdominal pain. So we've got the A, B and the C going there. To test this, these children underwent a lot of uh, procedures. So. Gastroenterolo gastroenterological testing, neurological testing uh, for brain development, developmental assessment, and review of de developmental records. So they're getting a lot of data about a lot of different aspects of these children's physical and mental development. Specifically, they say all of these medical procedures. And this is important because they are showing kind of the scientific rigor behind their experiment. It's not just, so they interviewed these kids and their parents said, there's something wrong with them. And the doctor said, did you give them a vaccine? Yes. Well, that must be it. That's sort of the caricature version. They actually did a, a lot more work behind the scenes there. So you get some of the, the names here. You might recognize MRI and EEG, um, lumbar puncture. The others, if you've watched too many episodes of Grey's Anatomy, those probably show up occasionally. Um, we've done under sedation, which is good because <laughs> these are very painful. Uh, they also mentioned a barium follow through radiography. This is a form of x-ray and they look at different medical profiles. Um, and this basically means that they evaluate, run the numbers, they evaluate the results for each of these types of uh, studies and each kind of aspect of the, the kid's health. So we have biochemical, hematological, which has to do with blood, and immunological, which of course has to do with their immune systems. Here are the findings. Um, and this is the first time, I believe, let me double check that. It's the first time where they specifically mention MMR vaccine. So the parents gave this data because, of course, these are little kids, they, they don't necessarily have the capacity to explain all their symptoms, but said their parents associated the onset of behavioral symptoms, so we can hear in shorthand say autism, with the vaccination in eight of the 12 children. They associated it with a measles infection with one child and with otitis media, which is a different kind of, of infection in another. So this is of course eight of the 12, that's what he's most interested in. 
um, pointing out that all 12 had problems with their intestines, fairly serious problems given that they were sent to a, a specialist, and he, he names them here. He gives some information on the histological data. And then he talks about here the behavioral disorders, the psychological and mental health end. So they included diagnoses of autism, disintegrative psychosis, and possible postviral or vaccinal encephalitis. Um, some of these other tests were normal, but there were some abnormal lab results he mentions here. And this is basically for the sake of uh, completeness to show what sort of patterns they saw in the data there. So what we get from the findings is this is probably the most important phrase here by the parents because he is confirming that the well he's at least implying let me put it that way he's implying that the potential connection between MMR and autism was first brought up by the parents Brian Deere's work showed that wasn't necessarily so um, but he says we found this in eight of the 12 children. Now, we'll want to talk about the sample size in our discussion because you could legitimately ask, what can you actually learn from 12 children out of a, such a huge population? But if you've got 75% of your patients exhibiting the same thing, that is definitely cause for concern. You know, we, we're seeing this again with COVID-19. How many have symptom X or symptom Y, how many have underlying health conditions? And I see different numbers here. One article said something like 80 to 90% of COVID-19 hospitalizations were people with pretty serious underlying health conditions, usually with an average of three or four other diagnoses. It's a different debate for perhaps a different time, but there, the numbers are potentially um, problematic here. And then the interpretation, um, this is sort of a mild statement, but um, this is the, the so what. We identified a, an association, so a connection uh, with the call, say it was generally associated in time with possible environmental triggers, which means the vaccines, but he doesn't want to quite say that flat out here. He does say that flat out in the video that I mentioned earlier. Um, so that kind of all the subtlety of the article is kind of thrown out the window at that point. But he is saying that developmental regression and gastrointestinal disease show up at the same time in a group of previously normal children. And this is this is the key point here, because his argument is that autism and these other um, diagnoses, these other behavioral disorders he's identified here are the result of external environmental triggers and not of, for instance, a genetic disorder. Um, and the jury's definitely still out on, on some of those questions there, but this is, uh, this is a pretty groundbreaking claim that these, these children started off normal and because of the triggers here, which he identifies as the vaccination, they developed both the physical and the mental and psychological issues. So you can see why this would generate a lot of discussion to start with, um, even without his um, announcement on television that they had proven the, the causal link. Um, here are a couple of slides and of potential discussion questions. So if you are stuck on what to do, I will raise these questions in our discussion. So it might be good just to start writing stuff down on how you can potentially respond to those. So I know you're awake and actually listening, um, even when you have your video off and chat muted. And then, so start with some questions on autism and vaccinations in general, and then some specific questions that I would recommend going through um, as you read about Wakefield's paper. All right, so we will get back to that on Zoom. In the meantime, um, let me give you a preview of the week five material. We're getting, actually we're, we're at midterm because we're doing a nine week quarter uh, this time. 
So our Tuesday assignments, those will be for May 5th. I'm going to be lecturing on revision, editing, and proofreading. Um, some of my favorite topics, I literally edit for a living, so I'll try to keep that under six hours, but no promises. To prepare for that, I'd like you to read um, two chapters and they say, I say. One is called Skeptics May Object, and the other is called He Contends. I also want to um, you know, read the Guide to Self-Editing. I've linked to this on the week five uh, lecture materials um, on Blackboard. It's just a two-page handout, but it's very practical advice for starting the editing process. And we'll talk about some of that um, as well in the, I'll talk about that in the lecture. So the lecture will be up uh, next week. And the big thing is the final draft of paper one is due by 11.59 p.m. on Tuesday, May 5th. So that will be at least, what, five or six days after your individual meeting with me. So you have feedback, you have a chance to uh, identify some revision priorities. And I sent out an email early with uh, Having to, unfortunately, to revise the, the tool for finding those signups. I'll, I'll get this right eventually in one of these quarters, uh, but hopefully we can get those all squared away as well. For Thursday, which will be May 7th, we're going to start the series that I mentioned earlier, looking at the Stanley Milgram uh, infamous obedience study. And to start off, I'd like you to read Milgram's original study. This is 115 to 130 in your textbook. Um, and as well as Joseph D. Mao's personal account, he was one of the participants um, resisting authority from 175 to 179. Milgram's essay is from the 60s, so it's organized similarly, but the language is going to be a lot different from Wakefield. I'll also be putting out a video about the paper two instructions. So I'd like you to review the PDF version of those, which I believe is already up on Blackboard. If not, they will be soon. And take a look at that video so you know what to expect there. Um, paper two is our research project and it takes the place of our final exam, so it's a lot of work. Um, but I want to give you that information early so you know what kind of things are expected of you and you can start planning your work for that as we move past midterms and through our home stretch um, of our final, final regular quarter. Um, at Cal State. We will have a Zoom chat also on Thursday to discuss Milgram's study and Dime House essay, and then we will follow up the next Tuesday after that um, and talk about the Baumrin critique of Milgram's essay and the response that Milgram gave to Baumrin um, in that context. So that will be our starting with week six there. Last thing for week five is the second self evaluation, so it's a midterm self evaluation. And I'd just like you to look back at the work you've done so far this quarter. Um, it might help to go, go back to your first one and see what, did I, what goals did I set for myself. But just basically, what have you done well and what's been a struggle for you? Um, what skills do you want to improve? That could be writing or project management, whatever you think you need to work on, and what plans you have to improve them. Um, an interesting question, I think, is what would you do differently about the first half if you had the chance? So, you have a time machine, go back, what are you gonna change? Um, to do a little back to the future, Martin McFly thing over here. So I'd like you to talk in that some evaluation about paper one, as well as some of the shorter assignments that you've done, because you had a, a fair amount of experience there. So that is coming up for week five, the first week of May. And we're, we're getting closer um, to the, the home stretch here. Um, I know that the Wakefield and the Milgram essays are, are tough slogs. So give yourself plenty of time. And if you're not sure about anything, email me or bring up a question in our discussions. I'd be glad to talk through those with you. Okay, that's all I have for you for today. Um, be working on the paper one rough draft feedback, certainly this weekend. So keep an eye on Blackboard for that. And then you'll come back to uh, have our individual meetings. Those will be the 29th and the 30th.